Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's fireside chat about the Inflation Reduction Act and what it means for people living with rare diseases. For nearly 40 years, the National Organization for Rare Disorders has focused on improving the health and well being of people living with rare diseases by driving advances in care, research, and policy. To learn more about NORD and to access our resources and events, please visit our website at rarediseases.org. And you can also follow NORD on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. My name is Tiffany Sammons. I work in the Education Department at NORD, and it is my pleasure to introduce today's webinar. Before introducing our speakers, I'd like to make a couple of brief announcements. On May 6, NORD's Living Rare, Living Stronger Patient and Family Forum will take place at the Renaissance Downtown Hotel in Washington, D.C. Don't miss this opportunity to participate in sessions aimed at helping you and your loved ones to live their best rare life. For more information, please visit NORD's website. On May 4th, NORD will host our annual Rare Impact Awards at the National, National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. Please help us celebrate our 40th anniversary by joining us. And now I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Christy Martin is Chief of Staff and a Senior Advisor at the Center for Medicare Services. She is a pol policy strategist and has decades of experience working in the public sector with private sector clients and in philanthropy. Christy served several years in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Office of Personnel Management and Government Accountability Office. She also has served as a senior advisor in the Obama administration's office in health reform, where she oversaw implementation of public health and prevention initiatives under the Affordable Care Act. Heidi Ross is vice president of policy and regulatory affairs at the National Organization for Rare Disorders. Heidi has a passion for both domestic and global health policy. Before she joined NORD in 2020, she worked as director of U.S. policy and advocacy for Malaria No More and on Capitol Hill for nearly eight years in both the House of Representatives and the Senate. Welcome to both of you. Heidi, please take it away from here. Thank you so much, Tiffany, for your introduction, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. We are thrilled to have Christy Martin here from CMS to help answer some of our community's questions about the Inflation Reduction Act. Dozens of you sent in some great questions when you registered for this fireside chat, and we'll do our best to get through as many of them as possible. You can also submit questions right now using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we'll try to save some time at the end of this fireside chat to answer those too. But real quickly, before we start peppering Christy with all of your great questions, I want to share a couple of quick slides that highlight some of the patient benefits to the IRA. This year, there is no cost sharing required for most vaccines, and there are $35 per month caps for insulin going into place. And under Medicare Part D, those insulin costs are now capped at $35. And then in starting in July, insulin provided through a pump under Medicare Part B will also be capped at $35 a month. Then next year, when Medicare beneficiaries spend right into the catastrophic phase of their Medicare Part D coverage, Right now, they're still required to pay 5% of all of their drug costs. But next year, people with Medicare Part D who fall into that catastrophic phase won't have to pay any coinsurance or co-payments during that phase for their Medicare prescription drugs. Also next year, the low-income sub subsidy or extra help available under Medicare Part D will be available to people with limited resources who earn less than 150% of the federal poverty level. For a single individual, that's about $21,800 a year, or for a family of two, that's about $30,000 a year. Then in 2025, there will be a $2,000 out-of-pocket cap for Medicare Part D beneficiaries. And instead of those big co-pays and co-insurance requirements hitting you hard in the first month or two of a new year, enrollees will have the benefit of spreading those co-payment insurance costs over the course of the full year. This is something we kind of refer to as a smoothing mechanism. And then the focus of this webinar, uh, starting in 2026 and for the next several years, you will see Medicare negotiate the prices of some, but definitely not all drugs. We'll spend some more time talking with Christy about that now because we know you've got a lot of questions about it. So let's get started. Uh, Christy, last August, Congress passed, President, Congress passed and President Biden signed into law the Inflation Reduction Act. Now the government agency you work for, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, is tasked with implementing the IRA. Can you tell us what that actually means? Yeah, Heidi, and I just want to start off by saying I'm thrilled to be with you all today. I think it's 
I came from a patient advocacy background. I worked for Easter Seals and the American Cancer Society when I first started in DC. And so, and worked for Henry Waxman for a few years as well. So, you know, just really happy to be with this community and to be talking to you all about what I'm working on now um, and really believe in the power of patient advocacy. So, you know, you ask a great question. I think a lot of people, you know, really are like, well, what does that mean? What is the agency doing or CMS doing when we say we're implementing the law? It's a couple of different things, right? It is we're building the operations necessary to actually make sure that those provisions that Congress created and that the president signed are able to be delivered to people with Medicare. So like, what are, what are all the ma machine that needs to happen, right, to make sure that those get executed? And you mentioned too this year, Heidi, which are, are the no cost recommended insulins in Part D, prescription drug uh, coverage, and the $35 monthly copay cap on insulins in Part D, and then in Part B later this year. And it's like, how do we make sure those go from a policy to being something that people see at the pharmacy counter? And so the other piece of it is the law is really a framework, if you think about it. And so like anything, think about it like a blueprint, you know, building a house. Um, we're, we're in the process right now of making sure that that blueprint can come to life and be tangible and real. And so like working through if there's, you know, discretion that we need to make decisions on. And like, I think we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about negotiation, about where that may exist. Um, but really trying to make the law come to life and be delivered to people with Medicare. Now, I think that's great to understand. You don't get to make the law, but you have to implement the law. And oftentimes that blueprint example, I think, is a great one. You can look at the blueprint and you know where you're going, but you need all of the expertise and all the contractors to kind of build out that house. And so Correct. it's great to understand sort of where CMS sits in this. And there will be opportunities to engage with CMS as you're doing now with us. And you guys have an open comment period right now in place. Um, and But some of your advocacy will have to be geared towards Congress if you want to see changes to this law. CMS can only implement it. So we got a lot of questions for our community about how this is going to impact them personally. So a couple of them that we got are, when will I see some of the IRA's benefits? And will my monthly premiums go down? Will my drugs cost less at the pharmacy? Can you talk a little about the different aspects of the IRA and when patients can expect to see some benefits? Yeah, Heidi, I think your slides did a really good job of summarizing when some of these different provisions will go into place. And so right now, you know, if people are on insulin and they're enrolled in their Medicare Part D plan or their vaccines recommended by ACIP, for example, like the shingles vaccine um, or Tdap, so you know, you know, some people have to get a booster of Tdap when they have a new grandchild. Um, those are now available without cost sharing, including before the deductible. They should be seeing those right now at the pharmacy counter when they go to get their vaccines or pick up their insulin. Um, I think, you know, the, one of the things that we're going to start seeing, and, you know, you made a good segue about it's not just the cost at the counter, but premiums as well. Starting January 1, 2024, we're expanding extra help or the low income subsidy to be the full amount of the subsidy for people below 150% of the federal poverty level who need help affording their prescription drug coverage in Medicare. That's really exciting. People that have partial subsidy right now under extra help will be automatically expanded to the full subsidy, but it's also a good opportunity to, you know, call 1-800-MEDICARE. I think we provided some resources to you guys to share about, you know, checking to see if you're eligible for extra help or some of the other Medicare savings programs to help with your monthly premiums or costs, because ultimately that's going to help, you know, make those costs go down, not only at the pharmacy, but the premiums. And then we have some provisions going into effect, you know, related to the actual cost sharing within your Part D prescription drug plan. So you mentioned the, co the cost sharing related to catastrophic coverage. So when people have that really high spending in 2024, and then they start paying the 5% cost sharing, once they hit that catastrophic limit, that will be eliminated and they won't have any cost sharing after that point starting in 2024. And then in 2025, Everybody in Medicare Part D will have a $2,000 maximum out-of-pocket limit on their drug costs. We're really excited on for these, you know, these changes. We think that they're great improvements to Medicare and to making prescription drugs more affordable for those that are on 
uh, Medicare and in, enrolled in the prescription drug coverage. Yeah, Christy, I think that you highlighted a couple of really great things that are super important to Medicare beneficiaries and are going to have a lot of benefits. Some of the questions we got were around um, people who don't have Medicare. And so we know that many people with rare diseases also rely on their state's Medicaid program or their employer's health insurance or plans that are offered through the Affordable Care Act. Will patients who don't have Medicare benefit from the IRA? Yeah, there are a couple of different provisions that are not Medicare specific that are related to the IRA. One of them is, you know, that the subsidies available for those ACA plans you mentioned that people buy either through healthcare.gov or through their state place marketplaces. Um, those subsidies have been extended um, to continue through 2025 to help people afford that coverage. And that, so that's available for those people who are purchasing under, under the healthcare.gov or the marketplaces to help them with their premium costs. In addition to that, there's another provision related to Medicaid and CHIP, CHIP, which is the Children's Health Insurance Plan, that's similar to the Medicare provision about recommended vaccine, adult vaccines. Recommended adult vaccines in those programs will now be available without cost sharing. Um, so we're really excited about that. You know, I think that there's been a lot of focus on vaccines recently and the importance that they provide as a public health benefit. And so now we're going to have a world later this year where across ACA plans, uh, commercial insurance, Medicare and Medicaid, people can get their recommended vaccines without any cost sharing. Oh, I think that's really fantastic. I think we've seen the importance of, of vaccine access in recent years and, and mm -hmm. efforts to make that more accessible and affordable for folks, I think is a really important provision. It's nice to know that's available now too. I think a lot mm -hmm. of the talk is around the drug negotiation provisions and that work is getting kickstarted now by CMS, but there are benefits that our patients can feel now and they should be making sure they are benefiting from those. And I think we have, you, we have the slide that you provided for us with additional assistance to make sure people are getting those benefits. Um, one of the questions that we've gotten, Christy, is around the catastrophic phase. And we know that right now for 2023, that is about $7,400 a year for patients who hit that catastrophic phase. When the, when the Inflation Reduction Act's $2,000 cap for Medicare Part D drugs goes into place, will that cover drugs that are used off-label as well, or will it only be available for products that are used on-label? Yeah, that's a great question. It is related to any drug costs that are incurred in the prescription drug program. So under somebody's prescription drug coverage in Part D, regardless of like what the drugs are specifically, it's are they using those drugs? Are they encouraging, incurring costs under their plan? That's really what's driving toward being eligible for the, the elimination of the catastrophic cost sharing. And so, you know, whether it's on-label or off-label really doesn't apply. It's, it's about whether the drug is covered under your plan and are you incurring costs toward it that's helping you to reach that threshold amount where that 5% will be eliminated. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for clearing that. We'll talk a little bit more about off-label use here down the line because that is something that is really prevalent in our community. Um, a couple of specific questions we got is... Uh, will the IRA's drug pricing provisions impact the price and availability of generics? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think that not directly, but it could have potential indirect positive impacts. You know, for example, we talked a little bit about changing the cost sharing and the improvements in Medicare Part D to make drugs more affordable. So, for example, if somebody is on a mix of generic and brand name drugs and they reach that catastrophic limit, in 2024, then that elimination of their cost sharing for the 5% applies across all drugs, not just brand or you know generic, but all, all their drug costs. Similarly, with a $2,000 out-of-pocket cap, um, it doesn't really matter what your mix of drugs is. Once you have that $2,000 in 2025, um, you won't have to pay any more out-of-pocket for your drugs under Medicare Part D. You know, I think there's also some other provisions that are maybe not as patient oriented or you know facing that are actually helping to hopefully encourage biosimilar competition um, that we've made in changes in Part B related to the law. One is a temporary add-on payment to providers. Uh, so a temporary increase in how much uh, they get paid to acquire biosimilar products so that they can give those choices to their patients. That went into effect in October. 
And then we have some other provisions, for example, that you know should help to make drugs overall more affordable if you look at it as a package. And then I know we'll talk a little bit about negotiation, but I think you know our hope for negotiation is that not only could it drive the ability to have access to more affordable drugs in Medicare, but it might actually encourage indirectly companies to encourage competition to come to the market. We are negotiating drugs that currently don't have competition uh, will be ones that are eligible for selection and negotiation um, that have been on the market for quite some time. And so if competition does come to the market, they would no longer be eligible. So there's kind of a win-win there for generic companies and biosimilars and brands if they can, you know, work to create an agreement where they can bring those competition on the market a little bit earlier. Can you just for our community's benefit, Christy, explain the difference between a biologic and a biosimilar and just what what that means? Because I think our community is well acquainted with biologics, but biosimilars are a little bit of a newer newer concept for our, for our community. Yeah. So um, when, when we talk about like biologics and biosimilars and generics, think about it as for small molecule or chemical drugs, chemical compounded drugs, those are small molecule. And the generic is basically the lower cost copy of that that creates price competition. Um, in the biologic space, because they're biologics, they're large molecule, um, non-chemical. Um, creating a, an exact copy, like a Xerox of it, is a little bit more complicated. And so they're called biosimilars. And so they're clinically equivalent, they go through the same FDA testing for safety and efficacy, mm -hmm. and they're therapeutic alternatives to the biologic, but not an interchangeable, don't have interchangeable status like a generic and a small molecule would have necessarily. It's just a little bit more complex, but it's a fair, is it a fair comparison to say that the thought behind it is as a brand product to generic, a biologic to a biosimilar? Yeah, that's completely fair. And I think, you know, it, it's it's a newer concept in the U.S., especially the biosimilar pathway and FDA's pathway to approve those drugs uh, just started under the Affordable Care Act. So, you know, it's still a little early on in developing that market. So a lot of people, you know, may not even be aware that they are on a biosimilar versus a biologic um, because they do have their unique names. But yeah, that's a great way to to compare it on, on a very simple level. Awesome, great. Well, Christy, this is a, you know, we're NORD and we're <laughs> the rare disease community. So let's talk a little bit about the rare disease specific implications. And we know that for many people living with a rare disease, the out-of-pocket prescription drug costs are a real burden and can make it difficult for patients to actually obtain the therapies they need. And at the same time, with more than 90% of all rare diseases lacking an FDA approved treatment, a lot of our community is still hoping for a safe and effective treatment for their condition. So mm -hmm. We know there needs to be a, a you know, striking the right balance between affordability and the ability to develop new treatments for rare diseases. So let's talk a little bit about the rare disease impact. And mm -hmm. How will rare disease patients, will they still be able to access the treatments that they have that are safe and effective? Could they lose treatment under the access to their treatment under the Affordable Care Act or not under the Affordable Care Act, under the IRA? Wow. Yeah, I, yeah, no worries, Heidi. I worked on the Affordable Care Act for several <laughs> years, so like totally understand. And there's a lot of similarities between the IRA and the Affordable Care Act. You know, I think that, you know, there's millions of people that can't afford to access the drugs that are currently on the market. And we believe that if patients can't afford the drugs they need, they're, they're not really able to benefit from innovation. So we're hoping this new law provides meaningful financial relief for millions of people with Medicare by improving access to affordable treatments and strengthening Medicare both now and in the long run. Mm -hmm. um, we are trying to strike and thinking really thoughtfully about how do you strike a balance given what is in the, how the law tells us to implement it yeah. on you know, encouraging innovation and helping to support innovation, especially on unmet medical need, you know, drugs that are really meeting the needs of specific populations. The Inflation Reduction Act does not make any changes to the rules of coverage for prescription drugs in Medicare. And I think that's really important to acknowledge. What it does is it gives us new mechanisms to help to negotiate prices or alleviate those financial cost for the beneficiaries, but doesn't change what we currently cover. 
So I think a follow on question to that is, is, is CMS going to be negotiating every single drug cost or what, where are you guys going to be prioritizing that? And will all rare diseases be negotiate, all rare disease drugs be negotiated? Or are they all exempt? Tell us a little bit about the decision CMS is making around what drugs will be negotiated. Yeah, that's a great question. So a lot of our drug spending in the Medicare program is highly concentrated on the highest spending drugs, just like any economy. Um, typically, there's a small number of entities that are contributing to the highest cost. And so with that in mind, the way Congress and the ultimately the law that the president signed thought about, you know, and laid out the negotiation, as I mentioned before, blueprint is they said, CMS is going to negotiate a certain number of drugs every year, not all drugs. So for this first year, which will start in 2003, we'll announce the drugs in September, and we'll culminate in a negotiation that will lead to lower prices and maximum fair prices or negotiated prices in 2026, we are going to select 10 Part D drugs among the highest spending Part D drugs. And the way that we, we follow the law and the way that the law talks about that selection process is there are certain exclusions that apply. Um, so we'll develop a list of the highest spending drugs. We will make sure that they are drugs that don't have competition, as I mentioned before. So Drugs that are brand name, typically brand name, they do not have biosimilars or generics. And then there's an exclusion for the orphan drug that applies to whether one has one designated orphan drug and approval. Those will get removed from the eligibility list of selected drugs. We also have other exclusions, for example, um, drugs that are low spend in Medicare so that they don't hit a certain threshold of spending in the Medicare program. Those won't be eligible for negotiation. And then finally, you know, there's an exception for small biotech drugs. So drugs that are developed by small companies um, that may only have a few products and most of their spending is in this one drug in Medicare, those will be accepted from the negotiation program. So, you know, in the first year, there'll be 10 drugs in the second year for negotiation, There'll be an additional 15 Part D drugs that'll be included in negotiation. The following year, it'll be 15, and then we'll start to see maybe some Part B drugs, B as in boy, show up. Um, and then 20, the fourth year of the pro program and subsequent years. And so, you know, there will be these, this exclusion for an orphan drug, for example, will be for the entirety of the program, not just the first year. So, you know, we do think that that will help. And we're we put out, and I know that we've talked a little bit about this with Nord in particular, we put out some guidance, some initial guidance on to get comment on and get feedback on from the public about some of these issues and how do we find this right balance between innovation and affordability. And we're taking comment on if there's other actions that CMS can take in its implementation of the negotiation program to best support orphan drug development because we know it's really important um, it's a really important endeavor and one that should continue. Yeah, and we appreciate the outreach that CMS has been willing to do with Nord on this. This is one of our big priorities is making sure that this community's unmet need, which is pretty significant in the rare disease space, is not hampered by uh, the IRA and fully recognize that you're implementing the law and that there might be things we'd like to see changed about the law. So, you know, down the line, stay tuned community, there'll be opportunities to engage now and in the future on these important issues. But thank you for clarifying that. One question we got was around Medicare Part D and Part B, and you started to touch on it, but I just want to further reinforce Medicare Part B as in boy is usually your infusion drugs. Mm -hmm. Those are administered in a physician's office, but those aren't the first products that are going to be negotiated, right, Christy? Yeah, that's exactly right. So if you think about it this way, the drugs that you get from your mail order pharmacy, that you go to the pharmacy and pick up at the retail counter, um, those are the Part D drugs. And so those are the ones in the first two rounds of negotiation, those will be the focus. Mm -hmm. And then in the third round of negotiation, which will culminate in prices that will be negotiated for 2028, those will start to include Part B as in boy. And you're right, those are called physician-administered drugs. So think about drugs that are infused, that are injected by a physician or a nurse in an office setting, 
those drugs will start to go into play um, and be part eligible for negotiation. Great, thank you for clarifying that. So how is CMS gonna work with patients to ensure that our perspective on the value and the affordability of these therapies is a part of these drug negotiations? You guys are kicking off this process very shortly and it's about a two-year process that looks like before patients start to see that benefit and that negotiation negotiated price goes into effect but how are you guys going to work with patients to make sure our perspective is is known and understood in these negotiations too yeah i really appreciate that question you know cms is really thinking about how do we get input from a broad variety of stakeholders and we welcome input from the public at all times you know, we have really sought and will continue to seek feedback and insights from interested parties throughout the implementation of the new law. You know, we have a couple of opportunities like those, you know, I know the Nord's been involved with in terms of, you know, we have month, you know, quarterly meetings with a national stakeholder calls, you know, where we can get feedback from folks. We've also been talking to folks about providing feedback in terms of, you know, what are your ideas? And I know that we've talked, Heidi, with Nord in particular, like, what are people with rare diseases? What are their concerns about the law? What are their questions? Are the, the, the organizations that represent them have ideas for how we should go about this? You know, share those with us. You know, we will also be, and I mentioned that we have some initial guidance that's currently out for comment. Um, you know, that's another vehicle where people can provide their input. Um, and we know that you guys have, you know, been working to have a call to action for folks to provide input. And then finally, there's, you know, we have what are called information collection requests, where we collect information from the public um, to help inform and to give input to the data need, information needs that we have in order to operationalize the program. And we have one of those out as well related to negotiation. Um, you know, these are just some of the examples of ways that we're engaging with folks. I think we are definitely open to feedback on are there other ways that we should be thinking about how to get input from the people, including you know, some of the organizations like NORD, but also individual patient experiences that can help inform our implementation. Great, thank you for doing that. And we'll vouch for <laughs> being here shows that your you know, CMS's willingness to engage with our community. And we really do appreciate that. I think we have a lot of important perspectives to bring to this conversation. And a lot, of, a lot of patient experience that I think oftentimes rare disease patients are the experts on their condition. Mm -hmm. They know more about it than almost anybody else. And so I think they've got some valuable perspectives to bring to this conversation. So one more question about off-label use. We touched on it a little bit earlier, but this is a big issue in our community where often the only available therapies are used off-label. How is CMS looking to address access challenges for off-label uses in the IRA and, and beyond? As I mentioned, you know, the, the new law doesn't really make any changes to how coverage decisions are made. So I anticipate if people are using and getting Medicare coverage right now for off-label use, that will continue as it currently does right now um, with no changes. I think we're always interested in hearing input on if there are challenges specifically for off-label use in the Medicare program and would welcome folks like raising those to our attention and having a conversation about them. But when it comes to the IRA and the new law, there's not going to be really any changes there for people that will affect their access. That's great to that's great to know. So a couple of questions outside of the rare disease space, but really are um, about Medicare in general. And since we have you here, wanted to, to ask um, Retirees are on fixed income and they need oftentimes need a lot of financial help. Um, what else is CMS doing to make Medicare affordable for, for seniors? And then if you wouldn't mind touching on it also with Medicaid. Yeah, there's a lot of opportunities. I think, you know, one thing I cannot say enough is if you have any questions about your Medicare and, you know, affordability, there's two great resources that are always available to folks. One is call 1-800-MEDICARE. You will reach somebody that can answer your questions, that can help direct you to resources. The other is every state has a state health insurance program or a SHIP. Um, those SHIPs offer counseling services um, for people who are new to Medicare or have had it for some time. And they have certified Medicaid, Medicare counselors that can provide free unbiased assistance um, on their questions or concerns. You know, everything from what does Medicare cover what are like the different plan options that are available, whether it's prescription drug plans, Medicare Advantage, Medigap or supplemental, 
If they have questions on billing or denials or the appeals process, and then programs that can help with Medicare cost. Mm -hmm. I want to name a couple of them. We've talked a little bit today about extra help. Um, anyone who has Medicare can get Medicare prescription, can get Medicare prescription drug coverage. And some people with limited resources and income may also qualify what for what we've, we've been talking about is extra help. And these could be extra help with their costs for monthly premiums, annual deductibles, prescription co-payments related to their Medicare prescription drug plan. You know, extra help is a program to help people with limited, limited resources, and it can be an estimate worth an estimated $5,300 per year in assistance, which would be, which would be huge for a lot of people. A lot, a lot of folks who qualify for these savings, they actually don't know that they qualify. And you can easily call Social Security. And I think I provided a website to give more information about some about extra help and how to like apply for extra help. But folks can call the Social Security Administration at 1-800-772-1213 to learn more. In addition to extra help, for people who have limited income and resources, they may also qualify for what's called Medicare savings programs, which are programs run by their state. And these programs could help save money on, you know, health and prescription drug costs. So beyond just the prescription drug coverage and could reduce Part B premiums from $165 to $0 for some people. More information on the Medicare savings programs can be found through, um, through their state or by calling 1-800-MEDICARE and asking about the Medicare savings program. You know, I think that these are just a couple of examples of where there is assistance out there to make drugs and make healthcare more affordable for folks. And so, like I said before, sometimes people don't even know they're eligible until they, they like ask. So I encourage everybody, if they think that they're eligible, you know, look into these programs, especially if they're having trouble affording their coverage and see if they're, they're eligible for this extra assistance. And I think one of the questions we got in the chat was around what's the federal poverty level? And that's a measure that is set by the federal government to set eligibility for certain programs. And so one of the programs Christie's mentioned several times is Medicare Extra Help. And in 2024, the eligibility for that to get that full assistance is going to be about anyone, it's going to be available for anyone who makes it less than about $21,000 a year if you're a household of one and less, a little bit less than $30,000 if you're a household for two. So that gives you a sense of what your income could look like or as low as it might be in order to qualify for some of that assistance. In addition to the resources that Christy mentioned, you can always reach out to NORD's patient assistance team too, and we can help connect you with the right resources within the Medicare program too. And I'll just also say, Heidi, I think, you know, whether it's extra help or the Medicare savings programs offered by the state, some people can qualify for both. Yeah. You know, so it's always good to kind of explore what those options are because I think like, you know, like I said before, a lot of people don't know that they're, they fall under that income limit and that there is extra assistance there for them. That's great. Well, with our last question, the one that we got probably the most often was, how can I make sure I'm benefiting from the IRA? There's a lot of different provisions. There's a lot of different things that are going into effect at different points in time. How can I make sure that I'm benefiting from it? And you highlighted Medicare, you know, Medicare.gov is a resource, the 1-800-Medicare number. Other tips that you have for making sure that patients are benefiting from these, these provisions? Yeah, I think a great opportunity, you know, we have open enrollment that happens every October. October, last through December, for people to go in and check to make sure that their prescription drug coverage or if they have Medicare Advantage or a Medigap plan, that it's the right fit for them. Because we're making all these changes and improvements to Medicare, especially on the prescription drug side, I just encourage everybody to always go back and double check to make sure that they're in the right plan that works for them. Because, you know, it, it might make a difference of one plan, they may meet the catastrophic limit at one, one point in time because of their cost sharing, but it might be another point in time for the plan they're currently in. And just double checking to make sure that that, that plan is the right fit for them, given their current needs. So I'd say that's definitely one. The other is, I, you know, we have a IRA listserv um, that we are, we're publishing, you know, new resources to help explain what these new benefits are. Um, helping to answer commonly answered questions, 
Um, and we also have put together an Inflation Reduction Act web page on the CMS.gov website that can give more information and you know make it a little bit more tangible about when all these things go into effect and what will it mean for the individual. Um, so I would just encourage to make sure you know be an active consumer in their healthcare. And I know a lot of the people that we're talking to today are very active consumers in their healthcare. They ask those questions. They're engaged with their provider and with others to make sure that they're getting their healthcare needs met. And if you have any questions, always, you know, remember you can call 1-800-MEDICARE and ask or reach out to your SHIP program and, and they'll be able to answer questions and help. This has been great, Christy. Thank you so much for taking the time to educate us. We've got a couple of those slides we'll leave up so that people can copy those resources. This webinar will be available on our website too and on our YouTube channel. So I want to thank Christy for doing this. And there are a couple of opportunities for you guys to get involved right now, actually, if you're interested. As Christy mentioned a few times, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Service has an open comment period right now that is in place uh, until Friday. You can reach out to CMS, and we've made it really easy at NORD. We've got an action alert at our rareaction.org website. So you can send an email to CMS and let them know how you want to see this law implemented to benefit the rare disease community. And if you're a leader of a patient advocacy organization, NORD has drafted a sign-on letter highlighting a couple of issues we'd like to see CMS agree, uh, to address in the next round of guidance as they're implementing the IRA. And those include strengthening patient engagement to ensure rare disease patients have meaningful input on these issues ensuring patients have access to the negotiated products. As Christy mentioned, nothing's gonna change around the access to these Part D and Part B products. However, we are encouraging them to reduce some of the barriers that our community is so familiar with, like step therapy and prior authorization for those products that are negotiated. And then there's a couple of things around the orphan drug, the treatment of orphan drugs within this legislation or within this law that we'd like to see addressed just to ensure that the rare disease community can really benefit from this and that innovation uh, in our space continues. So you can send me an email at hross at rarediseases.org to learn more about how to sign your organization on. Um, if you wouldn't mind, Amanda, putting on the next slide, which is some of the links that Christy flagged for you guys, as well as the 1-800-MEDICARE website. And I want to thank everyone for joining us today. You can stay tuned for more ways to engage with Congress and CMS on the Inflation Reduction Act and look forward to talking with you guys again soon. Thank you very much for your time today.